Hi. In this video, we'll be talking about binary, how it's used by computers, and why it's so awesome. You may notice that the voice in this video is different than the other videos. That's because this is a guest lecture. My name is Calvin, and I'll be taking you through the world of binary. So, remember that the binary number system is a number system with only two digits, 0 and 1. We can represent every number using just zeros and ones if we follow the binary numbering system. Now we call a binary digit a bit. So a bit is a value that can either hold zero or one. Every digit in a binary number is known as a bit. Now why is binary important to computers? Why is this relevant? Well, it turns out that at the base of everything, at the very core level, computers are storing all data in binary. For example, if we look at this code, storing a character, if I have the line char x equals capital A, in our heads, we are thinking about the variable x holding the value a. And that's totally fine. We can think of it that way when we're programming. But in the computer, at the base of everything, the computer's not actually storing some symbol that looks like an a at the base of the computer. It's actually storing a string of zeros and ones that represent a. Now, why would the computer be doing this? Why, why is it better to only use zeros and ones? Well, it really boils down to being as simple as possible at the hardware level. We don't want to have too much complexity going on when we're storing and reading data. So let's look at the bottom of a CD, for example. Here we see that if you look really closely at a CD, it kind of looks like Braille. It's really just a bunch of bumps and valleys on the surface of the CD. So when the computer is reading this, it can actually read data off of this as zeros and ones. Let's take this little section, for example. When the computer is scanning this CD from left to right, it can see this bump as a one, this valley as a zero, and this next bump as a one. Now what's really happening when a computer reads a CD is a bit more complicated than this, but it really just boils down to this. It's a lot like Braille. And the reason we do it this way is imagine if you were the computer and you were trying to get a bunch of data off of the surface of this CD. If you closed your eyes and ran your finger along the surface of this CD, wouldn't it be a lot easier to tell whether your finger is touching a bump or a valley than it would be to tell whether your finger is touching a symbol that looks like an A versus a symbol that looks like a D, for example? It's a lot easier to say, hey, this is a peak, I can interpret this as a one. This is a valley, I can interpret this as a zero. And what's really cool is we're constantly finding better and better ways to represent lots of ones and zeros. We can do it with bumps on a CD, we can do it with voltages in a circuit, we can do it with high or low frequencies in a radio wave, etc. We're constantly finding new ways to represent ones and zeros. What's cool is no matter how we're representing these ones and zeros on a physical level, the end result on the software level is the same. So. How much data can we really store with all these zeros and ones? Well, it scales up quickly. So if we have just a single bit, just a single zero or one, there's only, there's only one thing we can store, true or false. Those are, the only, those are the only values we can really have. However, if we have a byte, which is eight bits, that's how many bits it takes to store a full character in Java. Then we go up to kilobyte, which is two to the 10 bytes, and that can store a full paragraph of text. And then we have, me and then we have megabyte, which you may have heard of, that's two to the 20 bytes, to give you an idea of how much data 2 to the 20 bytes can store, 3 megabytes is about a 3 minute long song. Then we have gigabyte, which you've probably heard of, that's 2 to the 30 bytes, and 16 gigabytes is how much storage is on an iPad. Now we're getting really big, we go up to terabytes, that's 2 to the 40 bytes. And it only takes 10 terabytes to store the entire library of Congress. That's huge. And then we go to petabyte, which is 2 to the 50 bytes. One petabyte can store 10 billion Facebook photos. So really see that these ones and zeros have a lot of power. We can represent a lot of data using a ton of zeros and ones. Well, how exactly is binary being used to store all this data? If we have one bit, like we see, we can only store two possible values, zero or one. But then if we go to two bits, that's doubled. We can now store four possible values, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Those are all distinct values. Now, if we jump to three bits, we double it again. We see that for every one of these values in two bits, all we have to do is put a zero or a one in front of it and we double it. So we see that every time you add a bit, you're doubling the amount of values you can store from the previous number. So n bits can really store two to the n possible values, two values for each bit. For example, if we look here in two bits, zero, zero, once we go to three, we can put a zero in front of that or a one in front of that to get two brand new values. Zero, one, put a zero or one in front of it to get two brand new values put a zero or one in front of one zero to get two brand new values, and then put a zero or one in front of one one to get two brand new values. So that's how many different values we can store with a given number of bits. But how does that actually turn into the songs or the text that we're reading? Well, 
All we have to do is create a mapping that defines what each of these different binary values will actually mean in terms of the data we want to represent. For example, if we have one byte to work with, or eight bits, that's two to the eighth, or 256 possible values to work with. And that's enough to store every character we'd ever want to type. So all we have to do is make a little table that says, hey, this binary string, that's going to mean A. This binary string, that's going to mean B. And do that for every possible character. Well, it turns out someone already made this table. It's called the ASCII table. ASCII just stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. That's not that important. What is important is that we have all agreed that this table is going to be the table we use to interpret binary zeros and ones as actual characters. So this table says that this binary value, 100001, which turns out to have the decimal value 65, that is going to represent the character capital A. This is why all characters actually are numbers behind the scenes. All characters can be represented by a number between 0 and 255. That's 256 different values. So this table is the one that everyone has agreed upon. We've said, hey everyone, this binary string, that means this character. This binary string, that means this character. And from there, we can actually represent any text we want using only zeros and ones. For example, if we look at this sentence, we can take every eight bits and that maps to a corresponding character. So if we take all of these, if we take each byte in the sentence and convert it to the corresponding character, we see that this actually says binary is awesome. These zeros and ones turn into the sentence binary is awesome. Okay, so that's how we can do characters. What about doing numbers? So in Java, an int is represented by four bytes. That's four times eight or 32 bits. That means that's two to the 32 or over four billion different values. That's a lot of values. But how are we going to use all of those different values to represent all the integers we might want to use when we're programming? Well, we could say, okay, with these two to the 32 different values, let's represent the numbers one all the way up to two, and two to the 32. But that leaves out zero. We need to use zero, right? So let's move the range down one. We'll now represent zero all the way up to two to the 32 minus one. Ooh, but that leaves out all the negative numbers. Okay, so let's cut the range in half. Let's go from negative two billion about to positive two billion about, or in reality, negative two to the 31 to two to the 31 minus one. And that minus one is to account for the fact that zero is in there. This is the range of integer representation in Java. We cannot store an integer that is less than negative 2 to the 31 or greater than 2 to the 31 minus 1. So in Java, you can actually type integer.min value and you'll get that exact value. Integer.max value likewise has the highest positive value. So what do you think happens when we try to subtract 1 from the absolute minimum value? What would Java do there? Well, let's see what it looks like in the editor. So here we have a program that's playing around with the limits of integer representation in Java. We have the minimum value that an integer can possibly store stored inside of min, and the maximum value that an integer could possibly store inside of max. We'll print them out and see what it is. Then we're going to try to subtract one from the minimum value and add one to the maximum value and see what happens. Okay, so we see that the minimum value, that's what we expect. The maximum value, that's what we expect. But look what happens when we subtract one from the minimum most value. We get the maximum value. Also, when we add one to the highest value, we get the lowest value. So really, that's what Java does when you try to go beyond the range. It wraps around to the other end. So if we add one to the maximum value, we go all the way negative. If we subtract one from the most negative value, we go all the way positive. So this is just something to think about when you're working in Java, that really everything you're, every value you're working with is stored as zeros and ones behind the scenes. And that leads to there being limitations with the calculations you can do.